Welcome to Open Source Architectures uh, Monthly Meetup. Today we'll be hearing from Richard Bryce, who's going, who's a developer of the BridgeLink package of solutions for bridge design. He's um, worked on a couple of other projects, the Alternative Route project and uh, PG Super and PG Splice and some other things that uh, he'll be talking about and people can read about on uh, your LinkedIn account, Richard. Uh, Richard is a structural and civil engineer and has been working for the, um... oh dear, I haven't written it here. Which uh, which state is it you work in, work in, Richard? Washington State. Washington State Department of Transport, exactly. So you've said that you've got about uh, 30, 40 minutes of uh, presentation. Uh, yes. I'm looking forward to that. And then we'll have some questions. Um, can people interrupt you with questions if they have some on the way? Yes, please do. So people are free to do that. There are some functions here to raise your hand, but you can also just turn on your microphone and say, excuse me, and, um, and we'll get into it. Okay, go for it, Richard. All right, let's do the screen share. Is that coming through? And turn the little camera back on. Looks here. good. Okay. And the camera's so, on. Yep. Great. And let me get things on my other screen situated. All right. So, just by way of a little self introduction, my name is Richard, or my friends call me Rick Bryce, uh, with the Washington State Department of Transportation. I'm uh, the bridge design technology unit manager there, where I oversee the application of all of our design related computing technology and I'm the developer of our in-house bridge engineering software applications. I've been with the department for 30 years. Um, you can kind of see my background there. I'm a registered professional engineer. I'm very involved in the uh, industry with uh, uh, PCI, that's the Precast Concrete Institute. I'm a member of the bridge committee and, and chair their uh, subcommittee on girder stability. Um, I participate in AASHTO T10 Committee on Concrete Design. AASHTO is the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials. So that's kind of the, the governing body for public bridge design in the U.S. And I also serve on the FIB Task Group on Pre-Stressed Concrete. So the bottom of the screen there is my LinkedIn address. So you can check out more of that if you're so inclined. So I want to talk about our uh, bridge link suite of applications. It's um, Washington DOT's extensible bridge engineering application framework, where we um, link together all of our main applications into this co co cohesive and consistent kind of environment. And we're looking at doing other kind of linking to other applications, possibly through IFC, which seems very promising. Um, uh, the, the framework is extensible or we can plug in new applications as needed and individual applications themselves can be extended by plugging in extensions or, or, or third party um, plugins to it. This is all part of our open source software effort, which um, we originally called the alternate route project. You know, alternate routes kind of a transportation type term and we're in the transportation sector. And the idea early on was that, uh, and it's still, I believe, valid, that open source software is really an excellent fit for government developed software. Um, I think you folks are, are very involved in the open source community, so I probably don't need to spend a lot of time on telling you what open source is and the idea of, uh, you know, you, you can use it for whatever you want, you can distribute it, you can uh, make derivative works. All that good stuff applies. Um, let's see, we, we chose this open source model because ultimately it gives us a lot more benefit than any other model would have. All right, um, at the Department of Transportation, we develop our software tools to use them as tools. Our goal is not to have a commodity that we sell, right? And, you know, we do things more efficiently with these tools and we build them when commercial offerings um, aren't sufficient for our needs or aren't available. Right? And we don't lose any value at all in, our, in the use of the software as a tool if other people have it and use it. In fact, we get a lot of great benefits out of that. 
you know, we, the, the software development group consists of basically me. It's one person. So I've been able to really maximize what I've been able to do by getting the software out and having people use it. We've minimized defects uh, because of a broad and diverse usage. You know, engineers in other states are designing the same kind of bridges, but they have different localized requirements and things. And, and you know, there's just smart people all over the world and everybody's got great ideas. So we've been able to increase the robustness of the tools um, based on feedback we've got from external uh, users of it. Um, so it's really been really been very successful. We've been doing collaborative development with some other state agencies, um, state DOTs in the country. So we've been able to reduce development costs that way, basically get more bang for our buck. Um, back in 2004, long ago, I did a, a, a paper, I co-authored a paper in a, a little publication called uh, Government Technology that kind of lays out the case of why it's a good idea for government developed software to be open source. Um, having said that, I never really had the time or effort to um, go out and push the idea hard throughout government and get a lot of traction. You know, I had bridge engineering software to develop. So in some ways, the alternate route project never really took off, but the ideas have been very successful in the uh, arena I worked in. We've done uh, development work with um, uh, Texas Department of Transportation. They're our primary development partner in this work. And it works because it's open source software. We don't have to have any fancy agreements or anything. We just decided it's better to work together than do the same thing twice. Um, Kansas Department of Transportation worked this work for us, or sorry, not for us, with us for quite a number of years, bringing in features that to the software suites that they thought were important. And then there's um, um, contractors that have uh, worked for us in Texas um, that still do that kind of work. In addition, they've taken the software and made their own offering of it by developing um, extensions and plugins and added value services. And that's all great with us at the Washington DOT, um, bringing a lot of value to us. So all of the um, application tools are out there on our GitHub repositories, um, basically under WSDOT. You'll find a bunch of sub-repositories. Sub so it's all out there. So let's get started with the, the BridgeLink suite of applications. And there's a bunch of little tools in it. We've got um, a utility called BarList that does uh, uh, reinforcing steel quantities. So we can provide, you know, uh, dimensions to generic bar bends and things, and it will estimate the uh, weight of reinforcing that we put those estimates in our contract bid documents. Um, one called the BE Toolbox or the Bridge Engineers Toolbox, which is just a collection of some um, older utility programs that are, are still useful. These things have been converted from uh, Fortran back on IBM mainframes developed in the 60s and bringing them forward into this environment in C++. So there's a bunch of little tools like uh, geometric properties of concrete box girders, roadway elevation, grades, crown slopes, kind of doing those kind of calculations. Um, composite bridge cross sections made from concrete or steel uh, uh, beam pieces with concrete decks. Um, uh, biaxial bending column analysis applications, one to do uh, girder stability analysis. I want to generate um, response spectrums for seismic analysis. We have our PG Super application, which is uh, pre stressed girder superstructures. I'm going to dig, take a little deeper dive into that one, so I'll just go past it right here. One called PG Splice, which is similar, but it does uh, design analysis and load rating of the spliced precast, pre-stressed uh, uh, girder bridges. Basically, you know, they prefabricate different elements of the bridge, different uh, pieces of the beam, bring them out and put them on uh, temporary uh, false work, and then post-tension the whole system together. So it's a great way to extend span lengths up into two, 300 foot range. Um, and then some utility programs, PGS library, it's just a 
a library building program for PG Super and PG Splice to build libraries of uh, girders and uh, traffic barriers and concrete types and, and things like that, utility application. One called TOGA, which is a kind of an optional design program that's from the Texas DOT. And it's really not used outside of Texas. It's just something that's specialized to the way they do business between their engineers and the manufacturers that construct the concrete beams. And then we have a cross beam load rating program that does the reinforced concrete cross beams and does a load capacity analysis of those. Um, there's also a program that's not really integrated into the suite. It's much older called QCON Bridge, but it's a really nice little plane frame program where you can run um, uh, vehicular live loads, trucks up and down the bridge and get the moments and shears and deflections out of that. Uh, so that's another little handy little tool that we have. Um, all the software is uh, available for download from the Washington DOT bridge site. I'm sorry, their website. Um, you all, URL is here. To get to it quick, you can just Google Washington Bridge Link or Washington PG Super or QCOM Bridge and You'll, you'll get there pretty quick. They show up quite high in the search list. Um, then you just install them and run them like you would expect. Uh, so that's kind of the, the high level overview. Next, um, I want to jump into an introduction to the PG Super application, which is really the primary application in the suite. Um, precast, pre tensioned concrete bridges are the most common type of bridge in the US. I'm uh, probably around the world because they're really easy to construct, low maintenance. Um, you can get long spans, really a durable, effective structure. So PG Super is our um, pre-stressed girder superstructure. And right? that's where the name comes from. Um, design, analysis, and load rating program. It supports the um, ASHTO load and resistance factor design specifications. Like I mentioned before, we're jointly developed with Washington and Texas DOTs. Um, and it's something that we really been, we've been working on for a, a number of years um, and really focus on advancing the engineering capabilities of the tool. So in terms of design and specification checking, it does an automated design where once you've laid out the configuration of the bridge and selected the primary girder types, the program will do an analysis and do calculations to determine um, how much pre-stressing strands you need, the configuration of the cables, how much force needs to be in those strands, what the concrete strengths need to be at the uh, initial uh, release of the pre-stress force, and your 28-day concrete strengths. It'll design the stirrups and uh, shear reinforcement and those kinds of things. And then it does very thorough specification compliance checking at strength, service, and fatigue limit states. And it looks at detailing criteria, uh, stability during uh, uh, lifting and handling of the precast elements. Um, it looks at constructability issues like um, slab haunch buildup, dealing with camber, deflections, girder sags. It takes into account uh, limitations of local fabricators because these giant concrete beams aren't something you ship around the world. They're, they're manufactured locally and different plants have different capabilities. Um, before I go real far, are you folks familiar with pre-cast, pre pre-stressed concrete, the concepts there? Well, I'm just an architect and I'm following along so far, Richard. Okay. So, so I'm gonna guess well, it's okay. okay. Does anybody okay. need to clarify some things about the type of objects we're talking about here? Just to break in if you, if you need that so that everyone can follow with us. Okay. Just in a, in a nutshell, they're concrete beams manufactured in a, man, in a, in a, in a manufacturing facility. The, uh, there are cables that are stretched, concrete's poured around them, the cables are released and it pre-compresses the concrete, giving it more strength. And then they're just put on trucks and hauled out to where the bridge is and erected and put onto the, the piers and off you go. So. Our, the programs also do load ratings, which is a, uh, an evaluation of the structure. Basically, it's the capacity of, of the structure, moments or shears or whatever it is, subtracting out the dead load, 
All right, what remains of that, what remains is what the structure can handle for the uh, live load that's applied to it. So it's a ratio of the available capacity for live load divided by what the anticipated live loads are. And so we do those kinds of analyses. Um, that's actually a federal reporting requirement for us in the US are the uh, um, rating factors for a structure. Um, so the software handles a, a very wide variety of precast beam types, I-beams, U-beams, uh, deck bolt tees, boxes, slabs. So this is just kind of a, a subset of the different types of beams it handles. And they're all parametric beams. You know, the dimensions are parametric. So we can come up with virtually any cross-section needed. So I-beams, um, tubbed girders, double T's, uh, boxes, voided slabs, and whatnot. And then it can be extended by, you know, third-party developed cross-sections as well. Um, so we built the application on the idea of a bridge-centric user interface. The idea focusing the engineer's attention on the bridge and the engineering problems at hand, rather than trying to have to uh, wade your way through kind of cryptic data files or, or project-oriented languages. And when we started this work, it was back in the 90s, and that was pretty much the, the norm. You know, you'd have like 80-column um, Fortran punch cards that were basically converted into 80-column text files. You'd have to code your stuff into it. And then probably oriented languages came around like um, uh, where you describe your input with words like span length is 200 feet, six beams of type X, things like that. And you'd be typing all those into a, just a word uh, text editor. And then the, the graphical interfaces of the day were all data driven. You know, you're, everything was a tree or a table of information. Really, there was, they were taking advantage of graphics at that point. So, so we had this idea that, you know what, you're working on a bridge, things should look like a bridge and you should interact with the bridge. So um, most all of our work is still in the 2D plan section elevation type world. So that's the, the primary interface into the application. We've also have some 3D representations of what's going on and all the elements in the interface are, um, you can interact with them. So if you want to uh, define a beam, you just double click on the beam you want and it brings up the information about it and you, and you fill in the numbers. Um, so uh, as you work, you're just interacting with the bridge model and not worrying so much about um, um, how to use the program. It's more focused on what you want to get done. So. These applications are, we've designed them to be customizable and extensible. So we have uh, configurations, plugins, and extensions for it. Um, throughout the US, different agencies are, you know, we're all designing the same type of bridge, but the uh, manufacturers in the area have form work, which is very expensive for certain kinds of beams. So you wouldn't necessarily build a Washington type beam say in um, Florida or somewhere on the East Coast of the United States. They have different beam sections based on the uh, uh, form work that their manufacturers have. So we can build up configurations for different areas that have their types of beams, those, those uh, bridge owners policies, those things modeled in the software. And then you just change configurations based on wherever it is you're working so you can, we have this idea of these configurations in the cloud. You can model your, your state agencies, uh, um, types of beams and policies and whatnot, model it in the software, publish them out there in the cloud, and then engineers anywhere in the world can uh, access those configurations. And if you're gonna say work for Florida, change it to a Florida configuration, start a new project, and all the defaults should be set up, ready to go to uh, reflect that agency's way of doing business. Um, the program is quite extensible. We can have third parties come in and we've done that. This is kind of what that bridge site company does. They've came in with uh, their own custom bridge, I'm sorry, uh, beam types that aren't supported by Washington DOT. So in the New England states, they have something called next beams. 
we don't use those in the, on the in our state, so we've never put the effort into supporting them. So that's something they did is came in and add that support. They've added the beams to the programs. They've added graphics and reports to support them. Me. Sorry, your question? No? Okay. Um, they've made their own configuration servers, so it's very extensible in that, in that sort of way. Um, we try to keep this program as, as state-of-the-art as possible, so we're drawing in information from the um, uh, latest uh, research projects that are going on in the U.S. or around the world regarding uh, pre-stressed concrete. And those research projects are, are tend to be uh, very uh, implementation driven. So they ended up end up into industry guide documents and the specification requirements um, from, from AASHTO, which is again, a kind of a governing body for the US. Um, and so as a state agency, we are very involved in these industry practices and development of these research projects and sponsoring that kind of work. So. That's all just um, built into, these, into our application because we're really um, way out in front on, on the capabilities and being up with the latest technologies um, where some of the other offerings in the area of this type of program uh, aren't really doing that. So just a quick tour to kind of give you a sense of what the program can, can handle, a little more concrete thing. We can look at, uh, handle some very complex bridge geometries in terms of uh, uh, curves and spirals and vertical curves and super elevation transitions and all that kind of uh, geometric information that parametrically drives the geometry of the structure. Um, we can accommodate very advanced framing plans with skews and flaring girders and different number of girders in each span and those kinds of things, uh, different barriers, sidewalks. Um, the automated girder designer, it'll uh, do a bunch of number crunching for you based on your basic bridge layout and come up with number of pre-stressing strands, concrete strength, uh, um, where the girder has to be lifted so it's in a stable configuration, and how to haul the, the girder, those kinds of things. Um, there's some uh, detailed modeling of the girder in terms of the all the different kinds of reinforcement you would probably have in it. Um, the specification compliance checking, it's uh, very detailed. And what you'll see is um, uh, uh, all the specification references. I don't know if I have a little laser pointer. So like the specification reference numbers you'll see um, for the governing specifications, uh, the basic kind of summary information, like what your stress due to pre-tensioning, the stress dirt of the external loads, the total demand on the section versus your permissible stress limits. And then you get nice red, green, pass, fail information. So very thorough specification checking. Um, the software is not a black box by any stretch of the imagination. So for all of the calculation that is are being performed on behalf of the engineer, they're seeing the specification references, the equations, the number that comes into the equations, and the uh, computational results. Um, you get graphical uh, representations of results, so typical um, shear moment diagrams, deflected shapes, those kinds of things. Um, Again, you know, a, a really robust library systems for designing, defining lots of kinds of uh, beam types, barriers, concrete, uh, the project criteria that things are evaluated against, and so on. Um, so our our objective is to really be able to deal with real bridge structures, not simplified things you might find in a textbook or or a professional lecture series type of example. I mean, the real bridges engineers deal with every day. And again, like I say, we really still work in this plan elevation section world. So real bridge plans, what you see in the program really matches that. Um, so, you know, we can handle continuous structures, um, a wide variety of different types, you know, slabs with cast on decks, um, adjacent 
type beams, uh, beams that are spread out, uh, cantilevered beams for these elevated type of intersections, which are a bit unique with a variety of different kinds of stranding options. Um, adjacent beams with flange thickening options. So, so on these types of beams, the, the top of the beam is the roadway surface. So the crown buildup is built into the model, which creates a biaxial beam or a biaxial type of stress analysis requirement. It's asymmetric. Also, because of the pretensioning, the beams want to camber. They want to hump upward so we can thicken the ends, at the depth of the beam at the ends. So when it humps upward, this cup shape flattens out to get the right roadway surface that you want. So we're looking at all those geometric um, elements as well. Um, Pre-cambering is a, is a very effective technique for dealing with a tight vertical clearances issues. Um, we can build intentional cambers into the formwork, and there's some unique design implications for that. And we can handle all that work. Uh, design, I can model the substructure along with the rest of the, the superstructure. So we can take advantage of that stiffness of the columns and the cap beams, whatnot, in the longitudinal analysis of the bridge. Um, and we'll also do a load rating of that, that cross section. Or I'm sorry, that cross beam. It'll take the superstructure reactions out of that and apply it to the beam and do an analysis of that as well. Um, stability of long girders is, is a big deal. Um, there's been cases where girders have been uh, picked up out of the precasting bed and they've just fallen over and broken because people didn't think that uh, stability was an issue. Um, you know, and like designing, even in architectural design, you, when you design a column, you you make some kind of assumption that it's not ever exactly perfectly straight. So there's always some kind of little accidental eccentricity. So you have axial force and bending moment. It's the same kind of thing with picking up with these beams. I mean, they're they're never actually 100% perfectly straight, and you never pick them up exactly on the center line. So that puts the weight off center, and then they'll want to roll a little bit. So um, and same thing, you don't give and ever get them exactly perfectly on the center of gravity of the truck. So um, all that type of analysis is built in. Um, could also handle a wide variety of materials, normal weight concretes, lightweight concretes. Um, we're also uh, ultra high performance concrete, basically that, that uh, particle packing fiber reinforced type concrete is, uh, starting to make its way into the US uh, now. Uh, there's a lot of interest around that. So we are adding support to that based on uh, the most recent research coming out of our industry groups. Um, strand materials are also evolving, uh, like up to grade 300 KSI strand is now available, up, up to 7 tenths diameter, 7 tenth inch diameter strands. So, um, so the evolving materials are, are being uh, incorporated in the application as well. Uh, we're even looking at stainless steel and carbon fiber strand and carbon, glass, and basaltic fiber um, auxiliary reinforcement are coming in as well. Right? And the software just does all that and a whole lot more. So there's just a big shopping list. You, know, you can do your own user-defined loads and trucks and configure project criteria to match your uh, local you know, owner's requirements. Um, we can deal with really complex alignments, curves, spirals, and whatnot. Um, there's just a, a big shopping list of things that are, the application does. So just to give it some relevance, some recent projects where um, PG Super has been used. Um, I-5, uh, Interstate 5 in uh, Washington State, Puyallup River Bridge Crossing, they just installed some 223 foot long, that's like 68 meter single priest pretension concrete girders. Our understanding is these are the longest single piece precast concrete beams ever manufactured in the world. So, I mean, that's a, that's a big project. Um, uh, let's see, um, Interstate 5 uh, at Thorn Lane is a really interesting one. We see precast concrete structures here where they're single span, there's no center pierce here going over, I believe it's eight lanes of interstate traffic plus the medians and whatnot. And then there's a railroad through here where there's a, a clearance problem. So the girders in this span 
had the pre-cambering. There was extra camber built into it to improve the uh, clearance over the, the uh, roadway. I'm sorry, the railroad through there. And then this other one is being used uh, um, in the Seattle area, designing structures there for um, sound transit, North Link extension projects, which is a, com a commuter light rail facility. So not just highway bridges, these are being used for, for uh, light rail facilities as well and other, other types of bridges as well. We've had folks design um, uh, basically cut and cover type tunnels with this kind of uh, structure in the software. So really useful in that regard. So on to our work with industry foundation classes and this is kind of a BIM group, at least there's a lot of BIM focus there. So I'm very new to the BIM arena, but um, in the US right now, there is a transportation pooled fund project. And that's where different states um, pool their monies together to do some uh, research type work. And there's one on um, BIM for bridges and structures. And Washington State, as you can see, is one of the contributors to it. It's a five year, $2.1 million project. And I'm not directly related uh, and work in this project, but I'm just bringing it up to say that it's going on and it's been our inspiration for getting into the BIM arena. Um, but they're trying to develop an information delivery man manual for uh, bridge projects um, from design into construction, uh, uh, fabrication, and on into uh, asset management, maintenance, and operations. Um, looking at developing model view definitions, um, certifying softwares, or at least providing uh, information for that work and uh, stakeholder training. What um, we're kind of waiting on and preparing ourselves for is the IFC 4.3 bridge alignment reference view, right, to come up with uh, um, a standard uh, MVD for dealing with uh, uh, bridges and alignments. Um, so that, that's an ongoing project in the U.S. right now. And it's kind of been our motivation for getting involved with IFC. So my work in that area, it, I mean, really recent. I mean, last, just last April was the first time I ever found the IFC specification and started reading it. All right. And our goal is with our PG Super and PG Splice applications was just to exchange the alignment information that's in there and some of the basic bridge model data. All right, with the idea of, of folks being able to say like Bentley, um, Open Bridge, or uh, what, who is the like Auto, Autodesk InfraWorks, you know, they can export some bridge models into a standardized format for precast grid bridges. We can bring them in and do the analysis and design work and export it back into a format that they can read and keep going with those models. Also, bridge design is more than just designing the uh, the bridge beams itself, we have to design the substructure, the, the abutments, the piers, do seismic analysis. So we could, the idea is we'd like to take all that rich geometric information that we have in PG Super and PG Splice programs and export them so they can be picked up by these other applications and keep being used. And maybe even uh, preload those uh, uh, IFC models with information that might be used downstream in asset management and operations, you know. So we know if you know what those that information needs to be, we could stick it in there. Um, so I've been looking at the idea of doing seamless exchange, where the engineer just does export to IFC or import an IFC model without having to worry about what the details are. On the implementation end, I've been using the IFC Open Shell Parser, which has been unbelievably helpful. I don't think I would have had any success without having access to that tool. And I've even been able to contribute a little bit back. There's a full pull, a few pull requests that I put together to um, fix a couple of problems that I found and, uh, and generate from the IFC schemas, um, the parsing capabilities. So basically I kind of look uh, at a, a workflow where we would uh, take our, our roadway design system and export an alignment then we could import it, do our bridge design work, and then export out the details of that bridge design work, um, or even use our, our applications as starting point 
develop the alignments in there and then uh, with the bridge, then export those so they can go into a CAD or BIM system or maybe off into the structural analysis domain or something. So that's that's kind of the, our goals there. Um, we ran into some, some challenges along the way. Uh, the big one is, boy, IFC is a really difficult spec for a newbie to it. I had a, a, a lot of a hard time uh, learning this stuff. It's really, it's like asking somebody to learn English by reading the dictionary. But, you know, all, all the words are there, but there's really not a lot of guidance on how to put it together. And then what's worse is IFC really kind of is like having to write a novel to author an IFC file. So when you're trying to learn a new language, having to do something that complex is quite challenging. And the 4.3 spec is really in a, in a state of flux. Um, we've also had some difficulty validating what we're exporting because a lot of viewers don't seem to support the 4.3 uh, infrastructure ex extensions at this point. And we've had some of the big players that uh, we have access to exporting like alignment data out of it and their what well, their exports don't conform to the specification so we had a hard time reading that stuff so it made it difficult to test our import capabilities but we're managing um just want to uh, uh, give some acknowledgement uh, out in the ifc developer community at stefan yad from a technical university of munich really the guy has spent multiple hours one-on-one -on -one with me in this kind of forum teaching me IFC concepts. And Tom and his IFC uh, open shell parser has been a huge help. Um, so we've had success. We can import basic uh, semantic alignment information and profile data. Um, haven't quite yet got to the, the cross section super elevation data yet. Um, I've been working on that. I've actually had posted some questions out on the GitHub area of IFC uh, spec about how that's done. Um, and we can export the semantic and geometric alignment data, as well as some of the bridge spatial structure and superstructure uh, geometry representations. So initially we did some work at, um, with uh, 4.1 spec. And so we were able to export some information and have it loaded into some of the viewers that are available. So that's an example. The things we export now with the uh, 4.3 uh, release candidate for spec. I have yet to find somebody that can read that information in. Um, but anyway, there's a six span pre stress girder bridge on a curve, superstructure, kind of a bottom view of it as well. Right. So I'm going to wrap this up now, real quickly, by I'm going to do a little example problem of a bridge. I'll just, it's kind of pre built, so I'll just pull it up and kind of run through the paces of the software, and then we can do a little uh, 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 QA. And I'll throw the slide up a little bit later again, but it's got the download site for the software and my email address for some questions. So let me jump over here. All right, so I've already fired up a software and preloaded my bridge model. So we've got a, a multi-span, um, I'm sorry, a single span bridge, uh, you know, what is there, like eight, nine girders in the cross section here. Um, we can move our section cut tool around so we can see how the overhangs and things vary as we go around this curve. We can look at the kind of the alignment and where the bridge is on relevant, uh, relative to the overall alignment, the profile, the edge of edge of pavement, we're in a um, super elevated state. So there's a, the left and edge, right edges of the bridges are at different elevations. Um, so if I want to know some information about a girder, like I said, I just, I just go to it double click on it. So I can bring it up to find the concrete. I can dial in my pre-stressing strands if I want it. I can pick my strand materials. Um, I can say, you know, where's the beam supported when it's uh, released in the manufacturing yard, yard um, where it's picked up from, where it sits during storage, what the truck support locations are, what kind of hauling truck I anticipated to be hauled on, those kinds of things. I can use my little design tool and it'll go through and calculate concrete strengths and all that kind of information. Um, it's a bridge centric program. So, you know, you just interact with the graphics. If I wanted to change the span length it's from say 120 feet to 140 feet, I just change it right there, right? 
you can undo that. Uh, so if I want to know if this bridge works, if these like this particular girder out here um, meets the design, I can um, just come out here. There's a whole variety of reports available. So I can just do a, I'll do the detailing report since it has all of the details. So the little truck runs along while it does its calculations, right? It distracts you while it's doing its work. So we have a very lengthy report that provides um, our input echo, you know, our alignment, our profile, our cross section, uh, bearing elevations, concrete materials, and whatnot, and quickly navigate through it. I can come look at the specification checking. So up here in the top corner, we can see that it was successful. And then you can go, all the details of the specification checks are there. Uh, this, the limitation on stressing of the pre-stressing cables, the stress limitations on the concrete, uh, uh, the flexural capacity of the beam. You know, you get these nice uh, red, green pass fail. And then where do all these kind of summarized numbers come from? They come from the details. So we can jump down here and say, how are pre-stress losses calculated? So equations, specification references, all the numbers. Um, we have a very sophisticated uh, moment capacity analysis that does a strength compatibility analysis. So you can see how the, the cross section is discretized. Um, the level of stress and strain at each little element and how they're all integrated together to get the total capacity. So um, we can look at the things you would expect to see like um, moment diagrams, shear, deflected shape, you know, those, those kinds of things. Um, you can also take a look at your bridge, or I'm sorry, an individual beam, slide the section cut around to look at it. Take a 3D view of your bridge, you know, maybe reduce the transparency a little bit so you can see the beam a little better. Again, look at a beam, get in there, reduce the transparency. You can see the, the stranding details. Um, have some views that graphically provide uh, kind of multiple dimensions of the design. So that is uh, the application in a nutshell. All I wanted to show my the IFC. So let me just start a new bridge project. Take a second here, and I'll just uh, I'll just pick a just an I-beam project. Doesn't matter which one. Right. Load one up here. So it's just a straight, flat road. Not much going on. But say I get from our roadway, folks. I can say import my alignment from IFC. So I can pick one up here. It's a little bit interesting. So. I can pick it up. There's multiple alignments in the file. It'll ask you which one you want. And then Shazam, I've got uh, the alignment loaded up, the profile, not the cross sections yet. Um, and then we could export this. If this we did the coding of the alignment in the bridge here in the program, we could do the same sort of thing. File, export it to IFC, use a, a polyline wireframe for the alignment or the gradient curve. Uh, pick the IFC version, and then it'll just uh, save it away. And like I said, I'm having difficulty finding any, any viewers that can view it, but it generates the file, as you would expect. You know, you've got, uh, you, know, you know, IFC 4X3 release candidate 4. You can see it's got uh, uh, all the alignment information and... Uh, the polylines and the curves and all that good kind of stuff. So with that, that really that really concludes what I have. So sorry, I went a little over the time I said I would, but um, no problem. So I've noted down quite a few questions. So I okay. will start. I will start <laughs> with one of them. Um, pretty much in the order of your presentation, and that was just. How how has the collaboration between uh, the different users and 
from the different states. How has that been initiated and how's it been maintained? Like, how, how do you work together and, and how are you going to get more people working together? From a development point of view? Or for just a, well, everything a, like user, from um, well, from an end user or point of view, um, we mention this software in every forum we can. So, in uh, um, uh, say, I'll write a, a well, for example, the, the pre cambered girders. I recently did a, a paper that explains how to design a pre cambered pre tensioned girder and those capabilities in the software. So, that there's a mention in those articles that. This software is available, so people learn about it that way through these technical avenues. Um, it's been around for quite some time, and, and you know, I've gone to many a conference and talked about it. So, kind of word of mouth advertising that way. And you know, if I check our download site now, I know this isn't music or video, so we're not getting hundreds of thousands of downloads a day, but you know, we'll get twenty or thirty unique downloads a week on this from around the world. So actually, you know, we get a lot of uh, downloads from Indonesia right now. So there was, uh, I reached out to somebody who was doing that and said, oh yeah, I went to a bridge design class and a professor that used to work in the U.S. knows about this and he was, he was showing us how to use it. So it just gains traction just through word of mouth, really. And um, have, have there been any international collaborations? Not internationally, uh, no, not, yet. not not per se. Um, though there there are international downloads of it frequently. Yeah. I don't really track people down and ask them too much what they do with it. But so I don't know. If you, they use it regularly if, if they're just curious about it. What's that? Yeah, one would hope if they're using it seriously that they they'd get in touch and, and start yeah. talking. Um, and ha how important is it that that different jurisdictions have uh, has have different computational method standards? Is is that is that tricky to deal with in this type of project? It's not. I mean, that, I could I could just see you had a, yeah. a whole lot of different ways of, of calculating yeah. it. So does that does that basically mean that if if it's a standard way of calculating, then it's probably built in? Yes. If it's a standard way of calculating, it's probably built in. So some things are very easy, like um, like uh, the limit you can have on the tension stress in a beam when the bridge is in its final configuration. It's in my our state, we say, well, we want zero tension there. We don't want it to have any tension. Everything needs to be compressed. The national standard allows some tension, and different states allow different levels of tension. So in the software, it's just a parameter. It's a number times the square root of the concrete strength. So, excuse me. Um, so we just make different libraries with a different value there. That's the easy one. Other things are there are different agencies have completely different computational methods for, say, pre-stress loss calculation, estimating how much the pre-stress force reduces over time. And they're based on the behavior of concrete based on their local materials. Up in where, where I live, we have really hard aggregate that was brought by glaciers during the Ice Age. Other parts of the country have very soft limestone, so it behaves different. And they have different methods. That requires a programming effort. And if they want that, they've sponsored the work to get it done. Like Texas, they've paid developers to develop those actual procedures into the program. So, so they've, they've paid developers, but it's a, it's still part of the open source it's offer. part of the open source effort, yeah. It's, so it, somebody's got to do the work. But it's yeah. part of the yeah. open source framework. It's all there. I'd, it's open. There's a great uh, there's a great campaign from Free Software Foundation Europe, which just says public money, public code. I I think that's great. I think you get a great return on investment of it. And so in a lot of ways, the way when I started out doing this, you know, part of the pitch was we have 50 states doing the same thing, more or less the same way with 50 different minor variations. So why can't we collaborate? We can get a lot more done. Sure. Some folks thought it was a good idea. Some don't, but that's life. I've got a few more questions that go in that okay. direction, but what other, does somebody else have a question? I have a question. Yes, sir. Uh, I would like to, first of all, congratulations, uh, really a lot of uh, good work uh, 
on this uh, on this project. I was wondering, uh, I mean, from what I understand, the the the, the various uh, departments of trans transportation uh, may use this software to design uh, some uh, some bridges. Let's say that you use it, but. Uh, do you also interact uh, with uh, professionals, other engineers, let's say that they may also design uh, some bridges you may have to review? For example, do you use this the software also f as a review tool or...? Uh... Yes. Yes. Uh, so, in the course of our, our normal operations, we have more work than we can do. So, some of the designs goes out to consulting engineers. So when those designs come back, our engineers will review those designs and they'll use these tools. Uh, they also use the tools for uh, reviewing changes that happen during construction, you know, things like that. So the various consultants, they have to use this software, for example, to, to do or? Uh... Um, as a state agency owner of bridges, uh, folks that hire consultants, we don't require it, but Folks do, do use it because it is really tailored. Um, well, the configuration we publish tailors the software to our standards. So mm -hmm. it makes it very easy for, for them to do the work. Um, same thing, consulting engineers working for Texas. There's a configuration that Texas publishes that, that uh, tailors the configuration to their work. So you just say, put it in Texas mode, and then it works great for that area. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. So one of the things I'm wondering about um, Ionis's uh, question, Ionis's question fits very well into that. Uh, so you can't, as, as a public body, you can't require that they use a specific software. But now you're looking at developing, or well, is that not correct? No, we, we could re require it. Yeah, there is some softwares that we require are used. Okay. Um, um, for for uh, our long-term asset management of things, we want uh, certain elements of bridges modeled in a, a particular software package. So 20 years from now, when we have to bring up the model, it's in a... In a package that we like right um, and 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 as you were saying part of your work now is getting is making mvds so that you can so that you can require the 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 data structure describe the data structure you need to receive yes so, that, that... so i'm just wondering how how, how does um bridge link compare to the commercial offerings that are out there uh, you've already mentioned some some compatibility issues, but just sort of in, in very general terms, comparing, uh, I think you said it was OpenBridge from Bentley and, and InfraWorks from Autodesk. Right. So I personally don't have a lot of experience or any experience using those tools because we we have our own in-house in -house tools to do this. Um, they obviously have done an amazing job on the, the kind of the 3D modeling environment, you know, laying out the bridge, the piers, all these things in conjunction with, you know, all the utilities and river or whatever it is you might have conflicts with. And that's that's just not what the PG Super software is intended to do. Uh, we do the detailed fine structural design. And, you know, anecdotally, my understanding is PG Super has far more capabilities than any of those other applications. They're very limited in what they do. Uh, designers are left after using them doing a bunch of hand calculations to finish the workup. Yeah, um, it's quite tedious. Uh, so, and a lot of the uh, newer, uh, they're not kept up to date with the the specifications from Ashto, and you know we obviously stay right up to date with that. And a lot of the newer capabilities, like dealing with girder stability, pre-cambered girders, new material types. Those aren't being kept up because the focus of those other um, organizations are more on the 3D modeling type world. Yeah. So. Yeah, that's a tricky one. So, 
So yeah, so I mean, I really, and we don't intend to to really want to compete in that arena with them. And what we want to do is we're looking at IFC because IFC 4.3 and, and going forward, it seems to be a great vendor neutral solution to where they could export stuff to meet the standard and we could read it in, do our work. And engineers can move these things back and forth seamlessly. And we think that would be a great world to live in. <laughs> well, we're we're on the same journey together, I think. Yeah. We'll uh, we'll keep seeing how it goes. Yeah. Uh, so what sort of what sort of obstacles do you see um, to to Bridgelink being used more wide more widely? Um, I noted down here that that I was thinking there might be cultural uh, issues, commercial issues, political issues, technical issues. You've, you've touched on a few of them, but so what what do you see as the pain points that that are going to need attention for Bridgelink to be uh, to be more widely used? Um, I think it's very widely used in the U.S., and that's because it's based on the U.S. specifications. The biggest pain point for international use is the lack of support for international specifications. So it doesn't have the Canadian Bridge Design Code or the, um, the FIB requirements. Um, I think those are the biggest ones. So, so when you have to comply to a design standard, it's only really got the one. Right. So, but I'm I'm guessing that now uh, the the way that it's built makes it relatively easy to add other computation methods, or or am I wrong? Well, it's some some elements are more difficult than others. Fundamentally, moment, shear, deflections, load, that's all common, you know, around the globe. Gravity yeah. is gravity, right? Concrete yeah. is concrete, more for more or less. So, uh, yeah, I think it's it's plugging in some of the different computational methods can get a little onerous. Uh, and presentation of information um, might, might might also be an issue. Uh, you know, you actually would have to have, say, the Canadian design specification. Each requirement is going to have its own chapter, verse, number. That yeah, we have the same in Denmark. Yeah. The yeah, the report that has to be tendered is with with specific uh, layout. Yeah. 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 Okay. I was just going to suggest um, a, a, a target for viewing and importing IFC four X three would probably be FreeCAD if you haven't already been working with them. They they have okay. They have lots of similar tools and and. Um, Dion and IFC OpenShell and Yorick, they 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 all work very closely together on uh, IFC implementation and FreeCAD. Yeah. I'm pretty sure FreeCAD actually has a bridge tool, so it'd be interesting to see how how they play together. Oh, yes, um, I'll have to look into that. There, um, there has been some work on doing uh, like doing round tripping with IFC, mm -hmm. so you can actually get some uh, projects move between software because that, I mean, that would be fantastic, right? Yes. If you could do yeah. that, because then you can move your project to the tool that's a little bit better at at that one thing, and then bring it back again. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I know some of the holdup has been um, um, kind of the, the alignment definition uh, has has been in a state of flux. It changed considerably between release candidates and the uh, section solid horizontal uh, uh, geometric information that. It's kind of new for the bridges and hasn't been really widely supported. So it's a little different way of doing a swept solid based on a, uh, the word is escaping me. The curved alignment where it's station referenced uh, a linear placement. That kind of thing, whatever it's called. <laughs> I, I haven't understood yeah. what the what the hold up is <laughs> with yeah. getting all that stuff to work. Yeah. I just uh, I've dropped a link in the in the chat there. Um, this guy Hakan here, he's uh, at the moment he's he's got some uh, other issues he's dealing with, but uh, he would probably be the person to talk to. He does a lot of that type of transport engineering stuff in uh, FreeCAD. Very oh. uh, active uh, developer in FreeCAD. Okay, I'll grab that link. Does anybody I'll... else have yeah. some uh, questions before we round up? 
And thanks for your contributions to uh, IFC Open Shell. That's a, a project we in uh, OSR have dear to our hearts. It's helped a lot of helped a lot of our projects uh, get going, make things work. Yeah, that was really a great. I don't think I really would have gotten very far with IFC without that tool. So uh, I'm hoping that Thomas, that's in the chat there, is the one who developed it. I appreciate all your help. Um, it's really fantastic. If you don't have any, go ahead, Jonas. Uh, yes. Uh, I have, a, let's say, one, one last question uh, regarding the, I'm just curious to understand a little bit more regarding the analysis. Uh, I mean, you have uh, the guild, you, you, you have some uh, beam, beam elements, and then you interact, let's say, in the, with the profiles that you define. Mm -hmm. Is that how it works, more or less? Yeah, let me state that one more time. I want to make sure I understood your question. You want me to repeat? Uh, yeah, please repeat. Okay, yeah. Uh, no, I'm saying, uh, uh, let's say that you don't use uh, find elements. Let's say you use find elements to do the, to find the, Let's say the, the 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 internal forces that then you design the beams and the, the girders and stuff like that. I was yes. more curious to understand a little bit more about that. Yes, yes. I internally, so it's a a plane frame analysis. So it's not a three dimensional finite element model. It's just a basically a nodes and beams kind of finite element model, uh, but for multi span continuous beams. Um, the construction sequence. The beams are simple span. Uh, for part of their life, and then they are made continuous in a multi-span structure by casting concrete between yeah. the spans and putting a deck on. So there's stages of the girders acting as an independent unit. Each beam is an independent beam. So that's very simple closed form equations, right? Yes. W squared over eight moment, you know, very easy. Um, and then it gets into the full continuous structure. Um, so, you know, moments, Section properties, moment of inertia, uh, section modulus, M over S, P over A. But on a, on a 3D, let's say, with 3D core, uh, on the 3D coordinates, or you said. Right. It'll take the 3D coordinates of the model and bring it down to a, a two dimensional right. plane frame model. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, this type of structure tends not to be highly curved. So it's, it's, uh, fairly simple to make a, a straight line model out of it. Uh, the beams are straight, so there's really no torsion from a, a curved beam between supports. They're, yeah. they're straight, so it's easy to do a, a plane model out of it. No, no, I have to say that uh, if you look quickly at the program, you think that it's something simplified, let's say, as you said before, that maybe you just like for some research or for some example, but essentially you are in the end doing the actual bridges so it has yes. to be let's say flexible enough to to represent uh, the reality and this is not easy yes so even more congratulations because <laughs> you have managed really to make it look simple let's say although it is uh, it is taking into account uh, let's say the the real geometry mm -hmm. yeah it takes into the the real geometry even it, it even does you know pre cast beams camber upwards right and then you've got your roadway geometry, which is down slope curve. There mm -hmm. has to be some some buildup between the top of the beam and the bottom of your deck slab, so the parts fit together, right, in real life. So it it even looks at all of that uh, uh, type of geometry and, and figures out how much that buildup needs to be, you know, to make all the geometrics work out. So yeah, mm -hmm. works good there. Great, great, thanks. Well, if nobody else has anything to offer, then uh, that'll be us for today. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot, Richard. That's really uh, interesting project. Thank you. You've been for going me. for a long time, as you say. Yeah. So, a very mature project as well. We will uh, do what we can to uh, make sure people can make it that bit easier to find it and tell each other what it can do. Um, and we'll talk about how we can get some documentation. Uh, and links on our website. 
Thanks very much. Right, Thank you, everyone. Uh, enjoy the coming week. Bye.